Hey, welcome back to Aspire. Now, winter is the time that polo action really kicks off in the country. Delhi, Jaipur, Jodhpur. Now, these are the big hubs for polo. In fact, uh, we went uh, to Jodhpur to understand what the show is all about. The event that unfolded there had us totally ensnared. But of course, we also understood the lifestyle of a world-class professional polo player. <laughs> When you seek heritage, the Rajasthani city of Jodhpur delivers like few others. It's the coming together of a royal past, a continued lineage, grand architecture and a luxurious lifestyle. Every winter, the city of Jodhpur comes alive to thumping hooves, flaring nostrils, the crack of a mallet hitting a hard wooden ball. The players astride these fine animals, perhaps as valorous as soldiers in a battlefield. This trophy, the Royal Salute Maharaja of Jodhpur Golden Jubilee Cup, gets teams and players to contest more and more keenly every passing year. Apart from the many parties, the celebrations that mark the tournament, it draws some really fine talent. Malcolm Boric is one such. He's a professional polo player. Malcolm captained Prince Harry's team at the Centre Bale Royal Salute Polo Cup in May 2013. And he also serves as an ambassador to Royal Salute. Based in Argentina now, Malcolm takes to the field in Jodhpur for a few practice rounds on a fine morning. Just to get familiar with the Steve before his big game as captain of the Royal Salute Jodhpur team, one that has been formed for the first time this polo season. I've been playing professionally since I was 18. So now, yeah, just 18 years this year. It's been, a, been, been great fun, been a good ride. And now you're at Handicap 6. Yeah, 6 goals. Which the Handicap system works from uh, the basic, which is your starting level, which is minus 2, and 10, which is your Tiger Woods and your Roger Federer. Yeah. Level, so we're, we're we're on the way up still. Hopefully, we're uh, but it's a, it's a long career. Great thing about polo is due to the fact that the horses do the lion's share of the work. We can keep playing as long as we keep ourselves healthy. We can keep playing. So. You get to do a lot of travel, and Malcolm, that's why you know I'm so jealous. We're me. very lucky. We do what we love um, as a living, and, and we get to travel a lot with it. Winston Churchill said that a polo handicap is a passport to the world, and for, for me, it's certainly been the case. I've travelled to 27 different countries in the last 18 years. What is it like for a professional polo player? You know days that you're playing a match and then there are other days when you know you're just working with the horses what you see on the game on the match days is the result of the hard work that goes on behind the scenes the grooms the training of the horses the preparation that takes months and months to, to get ready for for tournament days a tournament like this where we come and we play uh, four days out of five or three days out of four depending if you make the final um, all the hard work's been done previously now training of the horses down, that's something that you do yourself and uh, you've got a breeding ground in back in Argentina where you spend a lot of time. Yes, no, I have a, a young horse set up, as we call it, a breeding program in Argentina um, on the principle that you breed out of the favourite horses that you've played as a credit to them when you retire them, you, you breed from them and also the, the cost of breeding and training the horses now with the commodity that have become polo ponies, it's actually uh, economically more viable to breed them and make them yourself as opposed to go and try and buy them in the marketplace. Right. Do you travel with your horses? No. We, I, ha I have horses that I train in Argentina and then when they're ready to go and play the international tournament circuit, I, I will ship them to wherever I need them to go. I see. But obviously, the, the more you train your horse, the more you work with the horse, the better the bond becomes and the more uh, union you're going to find on the field. Malcolm, this connection with royalty and the sport of polo, um, you know, that has perceptibly changed, but you know, as much as we like to move on, we seem to kind of uh, link back to the past. Polo is a, a, a sport of heritage, of tradition, of old, of old-fashioned values, and those are the values associated to, to royalty. I mean, brands like Royal Salute. The reason that they're involved in the sport is because it's those attributes that are involved in the sport. The game will continue to move forward, but you can never abandon the grassroots of it. And here we are in the shadow of the Maharaja's Palace here in, in Jodhpur, and this is where the game began. This is where the rules were written. 
uh, for the modern version of the sport polo. Polo has been around for 2,500 years, um, traditionally a, a clan sport, but the rules actually for the modern game as we know it were written here in about 1860. Right. Malcolm, how does one prepare for a game of polo? The day that you have a match, what all do you do? Well, sp sportsmen are very traditional and very uh, superstitious creatures, so we all have our pre-match routines. I, I think that the hour before the game is when you start mentalising a little bit about it. The preparation, the hard work's been done before, the training, the riding, the practice, you know, that hour before the game, you've just got to get yourself in a situation where you're going to try and perform as best you can on the field. And there's a lot of strategising? Yeah, there's, with the team. There's, there's there's a lot of tactics in polo. It might look like it's a disorganised, uh, you know, eight guys chasing a ball, but uh, actually there are a lot of tactics that go with it. Uh, the sport's very much based in, in, in pairs. You, you have a person you mark on the field and it's how to try, try and create the situation where your team is marking more effectively, effectively than the other team. But as far as the polo horse is concerned, they take a lot of care, don't they? Because you need to massage them, give them the pedicures. Yeah. They, need to be, they need to be groomed rather well. That's the hard work that goes on behind the scenes. The dedicated grooms who look after the horses who are there, we're living with the horses 24-7. Uh, that's, that's their department. They make sure that the horses are perfectly well cared for. I mean, if we don't look after them, they don't look after us. Right. So, uh, no, that's, that's 90%. That's a lot of the work that goes on behind the scenes is done by them. Mm -hmm. And which is why, I mean, you know, it's considered a royal sport because of all the help that you require to be able to play the game and uh, obviously it's an expensive sport because horses need that kind of care. Yeah, the, the pyramid behind uh, each player, each person you see in the field there is a pyramid beneath them of people who are associated to the preparation, uh, the purchasing, the training, the care of those horses. Inevitably that, that adds to the final cost. Um, there is obviously a, a reward factor to playing the game and you have to try and factor what you what you can earn as to what you can afford to spend on the horses. You know, it, it, this is the Formula One of horse sports, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that, that comes at a premium. Well, that's about all we could pack into this edition of Aspire. Thanks indeed for joining us. We'll see you around next time. Bye-bye.